So we had talked about in class, I was going to discuss a couple of the follow-up questions that we didn't get to. Uh, and they're just kind of some foundational ideas that relate back to why we observe the peaks that we do when we're looking at a different spectra. So we had talked about, when we were talking about atomic spectra, we said that we would have maybe our emission intensity and then a wavelength. And we would see that there's these very distinct peaks that we would observe that are almost like lines. But in reality, we see if we were to kind of zoom in in this section here and pull that out into more of a broader wavelength. So let's just say that's 583 nanometers. And we now have 583.1, 583.2, and we have our mission here. We may see that it's actually not just this anticipated perfect peak that we would observe. But we, we actually notice that there is some kind of broadening to the peak there that doesn't make it perfect. And that's not necessarily because of the energy levels that are available. Uh, one of the reasons that we observe this is that our molecules or atoms, whatever we're looking at, are moving. And so because they're moving, they could be moving towards our detector or away from our detector. And what we get here is we get some kind of broadening. One aspect of this is that we get this broadening where we don't see this sharp peak because we have this idea of what we call Doppler broadening. And this is just simply because our atoms are moving back and forth. And typically these are at high temperatures that we've atomized something. So they tend to be moving fairly quickly. And so if I were to say, if I just had a, an atom sear and this atom is still, it's not moving around, it's going to radiate out light. If we think of just kind of like a ripple almost that would radiate out and it's not necessarily any different between where those peaks are or those troughs are. And again, we're looking at perhaps this right here would be the wavelength that we would observe. The distance between two peaks is what we're drawing in as these ripples. And that would be, if we were to connect that back up here, that would be this right in this middle line here. And this is why we see the majority of the peak height is close to that area where it's not necessarily moving towards or away from the detector. However, if our photon is moving closer to, or excuse me, our atom is moving closer to the, the detector, when it emits this light, we start to see that we get more of this bunching that occurs. And uh, what we mean by that is that we get a compressed wavelength. So what this is going to do is this is going to give us a shorter wavelength of light that we would observe. And this is actually, when we're looking at this, as a shorter wavelength is a higher frequency. And this would be a slightly higher energy that we would observe that would then would be connected to the actual energy difference as we look at a change in transition. So again, this is a shorter wavelength, higher frequency, and that would equate to a higher energy photon than the actual difference in energy for that electronic transition. That we would see here. And so as we're looking at this electronic transition, that's what we'd actually observe if we're going from, let's say, a 3p orbital to a 3s orbital uh, in, in our um, atom that we would see here. Well, that can can connect back to also the possibility that our atom is moving away from that. And what that does is that makes this wavelength a lot longer. And so we see here we have this kind of expansion or lengthening of the wavelength that we'd see here. So we have a longer wavelength. This would be a lower frequency that we'd observe is also a lower energy for, again, our photon versus the actual 
energy that we'd see from that transition. Again, thinking maybe a, of a 3P down to a 3S orbital. And what does that do? We see that that makes it where we see this longer wavelength of light here. And that we can, I'm just going to shade this in as our green section of making it a little bit longer wavelengths based upon how fast or how slow they're moving towards the, the detector. And then we also have these shorter wavelengths or shorter energies. And again, based upon how fast or slow they're moving towards that. And so this is why we get this broadening that we'd observe for these photons based upon whether it's moving closer to it or away from it. And now if we see, for example, if, if we're just thinking of the trajectory perhaps that we would have of this atom here kind of moving this way, if our photon detector was actually over here, what we'd observe is that it's neither moving away from or towards, and that would also equate to kind of just here, this, this wavelength that we would observe here would be the normal or peak wavelength that we'd see here uh, in our curve. So that would be no change really, again, if it's directly port, directly to that. And so we see this really is maximized by whether it's going directly away from or directly towards that photon detector. And that's why we get this kind of broadening that is not a perfect sharp peak. Uh, so we see this here with regards to some kind of broadening that we get. And again, this is why we don't see these perfectly sharp peaks, but there is this kind of slight separation. And this is because of the atoms moving around and typically fairly quickly because they're at higher temperatures than when we have these things being atomized. So that's our first idea is we're considering well, how, why do we see this broadening, perhaps, that we see in a peak is not perfectly sharp? Now, if we weren't to zoom in, it would look fairly sharp. It would look like these really distinct peaks. Again, very different than our molecular uh, absorbance spectra that we would see or emission spectra that we would see uh, based upon those atoms that we would have being absorbed or uh, released, depending on we're looking at a molecule versus an atom. The next thing that we want to look at that is, is significantly important is this idea of what does temperature do to our emission ability or absorbance ability for an atom? And this is a, a relationship here that gives us ability to distinguish between um, how many photons could be emitted, how many photons could be absorbed. And what this is doing is this is telling us a population ratio uh, between our n sub j is the number of atoms in a higher energy excited state and that excited state is excited state j that's what we're just labeling as j n sub zero is the number of atoms in the ground state Right, again, that was our sub-zero ground energy. Then we would see, okay, well, that's gonna be equal to a couple different variables. And these variables are G sub, this ratio of G sub J and G sub of zero. G sub J is the statistical uh, weighting and this is related to the number of degenerate energy levels for that specific excited state. So for example, if I were to look at a 3P energy level, uh, we know that there are three degenerate energies when we're, when we're looking at our uh, 3p orbital and so that would mean our g sub 3p would be equal to 3 and that's because we have like the 3px the 3py and the 3pz orbitals that are degenerate or have the same energy levels and then our g sub 0 is again based upon what our ground state is our ground state in s orbital then it'd be 1 a p orbital then it'd be 3 if it's a d orbital then it would be 5 and we're looking at these degenerate energy levels and then that's uh, raised to the exponent of E sub J. And again, our E sub J 
Uh, maybe it's a little bit helpful or also more helpful to look at our delta E sub J, what that, uh, what that may mean, because it's really a difference. And this is the energy uh, difference between the ground state and the excited state J. So it's looking at the ratio between these, uh, that are say the difference in energies that we would get. K is a constant, so it's our Boltzmann constant, and then T is our temperature in Kelvin. So K is our the Boltzmann constant, 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd joules per Kelvin, and then this would be our temperature in Kelvin. And so now we have the ability to see that there's this ratio between these, and this is going to become important because this is going to mean at different temperatures, we're going to have different relative amounts of our ground state versus our excited state. And we're going to unpack this a lot more when we talk about absorbance or emission. If we want to look at absorbance, we probably want to have more ground state electrons. And that's because we want to be able to excite them to a higher energy level. Whereas if we're looking at our emission, we probably need to have more or would want to just to give us more signal, more excited electrons. And so we're looking at the ratio that is going to be helpful for us to see based upon the temperature. And again, temperature gives it some energy where those, those electrons could be transitioning up or down based upon a lower or higher temperature that we can go ahead and we can identify the uh, difference between them. So let's go ahead and do an example uh, applying this together. So what we want to do is we want to calculate um, the statistical ratio or looking at uh, the number of sodium atoms in the 3P excited state relative to the ground state at 2500 so there there is a sorry the number of ground state that there are 2500 so that is our n sub 0 we have 2500 uh, ground state um, that we would see here uh, and this is um, Sorry, we're going to look at the relative numbers uh, to the ground state. So we want to compare that to our n sub zero uh, at a temperature of 2500 Kelvin. So we want to look at the relative difference between these. Uh, and so let's go ahead and say what for Let's first start off by the ratio. What is this ratio? Our n sub and I'm going to put n sub j over n sub 0. We can more clarify, say that. That is the n sub 3p divided by our ground state, which is the 3s. So it's a relative um, energy uh, difference, relative amounts that we'd have between those. And again, if we're just thinking, it's going to make sense that this should be small because we should have a majority of these in the ground state. And so this is going to be our g sub j, g sub 0, and then the exponent of uh, our negative E sub J divided by KT. So we're looking at the relative amounts of these here. So again, we can go ahead and clarify this a little bit more and say this would be our G sub 3P divided by our G sub 3S. Again, we'll, look, we'll uh, expand out what we mean by each of those and then the exponent, and then the difference between our 3p to our 3s. So I just want to go ahead and show that again, divided by kt. Now, before we can do anything here, we got to look at what energy we'd be, we'd be looking at here. And we'd see we're going to calculate the difference based upon the difference in energies of the 3p and 3s. Now, if we remind ourselves, we look back at the different peaks that we would see here, we see that there's multiple different 3P, there's multiple, uh, uh, sorry, 3P uh, energy transitions from the 3S 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the average of the 3P. So we'll see here the average um, wavelength between the 3P and 3S orbitals based upon our sodium emission uh, figure that we have above, uh, that we've discussed in class, is 589.3 nanometers. So it's the average between the two different uh, transitions that we have uh, that we have listed uh, in our diagram that we first talked about at the beginning of class. Now what we need to do is we need to go ahead and calculate our energy. So the energy difference that we would see here uh, is between the using that uh, wavelength. So we'd have our E sub J, which would be the difference between these, is going to be our Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joules times seconds, times the speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And then that's all divided by uh, our wavelength, which would be 5.893 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. Again, that's converting this into meters here. So we go ahead and calculate that, and we get our E sub J, 3.37 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. So now let's go ahead and plug in all that information into our expression up here. So the ratio of our 3P to the 3S, again, these are the actual number of atoms in the 3P to the 3S, is going to be the ratio of these degenerate energy uh, electrons that we would see here. Uh, and so when we're looking at this, there are six electrons that can have be in the 3P, two electrons that can be in the 3S. Uh, we also look at our ratio. We could also see that we could see this is the same ratio as three, three orbitals in one different orbital that we'd see there. So we could either count it as electrons or we can count it as the number of orbitals that could, those electrons could occupy. So let's use that, that second example that we're looking at. So we have six electrons that could be in each. Again, we don't have to put this electron here, but I'm just trying to show us what that means, what that corresponds to. So that's our G sub J divided by our G sub zero. And that's going to be times the exponent of our E sub J, which we just found here. So that's our negative 3.37 times 10 to the negative 19th joules all divided by our Boltzmann constant, 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd joules per Kelvin, and then that's gonna be times our 2500 Kelvin temperature that we have. And this is uh, important why we used our joule Planck's constant value instead of the um, electron volt value. And what we see here is that we're gonna get this ratio of the 3P to the 3S is actually 1.72 times 10 to the negative fourth. So that would mean for <clears throat> the, the ratio here, if I had 10,000 of these molecules, we would have not very many of our uh, uh, atoms sitting in the uh, 3P versus the 3S that we would see here. So it's a very small ratio. This tells us the majority of our atoms are in our ground state. And we'll see this is going to come into play when we start talking about emission versus uh, absorbance, what temperatures are important, higher or lower temperatures for each of these. So hopefully this gives us a good background as we're now going to jump into talking about specific types of analyses uh, when we're looking at the different components needed when we're talking about emission or absorbance.